Well, thanks for joining me. Today we're going to be dealing with the quantum mechanical model of the atom. Specifically, by the end of this lesson, hopefully you will be able to write out and understand what an electron configuration is and understand what orbitals are and how they're a little bit different, well, actually quite a bit different than an orbit from the Bohr model. So by the end, you will be able to, if I hold up a periodic table like this and point to an element, you will be able to give me its electron configuration. Now, realistically, this will take a couple days, so this first day you won't quite be there, but later on you'll just be able to write out and, and say on command these type things. You'll say like 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, and, and this will make perfect sense to you, okay? So you see we have a lot of material to get through for you to understand this. So the beginnings of this are much less important, but I want to give you the historical um, value where this comes from. The actual what I need you to be able to do is simply write the electron configurations. All right, so this diagram is showing what is called an orbital. An orbital is a mathematical solution that says the electron can be in any of these spaces. So it can be up here or down here. Think about solving a quadratic equation and you get plus or minus two for an answer. So it can be up here or down here. Or it will be a certain distance away. This little center here, the XYZ plane, is the nucleus of an atom. So then the electrons have like specific little paths or regions of space where they will be in. Now, this idea was all developed by numerous people. De Broglie had uh, a part in this along with Erwin Schrodinger and Max Planck and Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr, just a whole bunch of folks. So de Broglie said that particles, that is like electrons moving, have wave characteristics. And it turns out that particles like electrons have both a wave nature as well as a particle nature. And the best way to describe it is that they have this dual nature. Okay. Now, I'm not too worried about this equation, lambda equals Planck's constant divided by mv. We'll discuss that when we do light calculations. That's not the nature of today's lesson. Okay. So if we're thinking about maybe you play piano, okay, or let's go with a simpler instrument, a guitar. A guitar is a stringed instrument, and when you strum the string, it vibrates up and down, right? Now, if you have a, a, a long string and you strum it, it's a low note, and as you shorten up the string by putting your finger there and strumming it, you get a higher pitched noise. So de Broglie applied his wave particle theory to electrons. And he said, that sure enough, they're going to exhibit wave properties. And, but there are only certain allowable wavelengths that come out. Only certain ones will be allowed. So it's not, it can be any wavelength, right? And so we turn that quantitized. So if this is our plane, this note can go up or down. The string can go up or down. And over here, we'd expect this to be double the pitch because it's half the wavelength, and it can go up and down as well. And over here we get one and a half wavelengths, and we can see those can move as well. Now let me explain it this way. Right? We can see those little waves going up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, this one, when they go up and down, it goes around three times perfectly. This one here goes around four times perfectly five times perfectly, six times perfectly. Those are what are allowed. Now, if two people sing together and they don't harmonize, then it's more like this, right? Those, those wavelengths don't end up in sync, and that's not allowed in the atomic world with electrons. All right, I'm going to skip this slide right now because I'm not going to ask anything about that one. Um, I'm, I'm going to really minimize this to try to speed up the video for you because this is not where we're going to be. I want you to have heard of the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Werner Heisenberg was a German, uh, probably a physicist, and he said it's an impossible, it's impossible to know both the speed, that is the velocity, and the position of an electron at the same time. Even if you could have a powerful enough microscope to see an electron, 
in order to be seen, it has to be hit by light. The light has to bounce off it. So this symbol here is called lambda. It means wavelength, energy. So light is going to hit that wavelength. And when light comes down and hits that, that electron, notice the electron got bumped out of place. So even though by the time you saw the electron, it looked here, but it actually had moved by then. And so that's what it means when there's some uncertainty about where the electron is. It's all based on the probability. Not, nothing's known with certainty. All right. Now, here's another uh, German scientist, Erwin Schrodinger, uh, and he came up with a bunch of very, well, I would say complicated looking equations to describe where the electrons are found. Now, in order to understand the mathematics of quantum mechanics, you'd have to finish algebra, finish trig, finish calc A, B, and B, C, and calc 3. Then you'd have to take differential equations. Then you would have enough math to understand the quantum mechanics. Okay. Now, let's just keep it real simple for us. If you use his math that he came up with, you get specific answers, finite numbers of solutions. And those are what we call quantitized energy levels, right? Like we talked about those rings, you know, they always had to go in sync, right? And so quantitized energy levels, think of it as a ladder. If you're climbing a ladder, you can be on the first rung of the ladder, the second rung, the third rung, but you can't stop at halfway between the second and third rung. It's not allowed. And that's what his solutions are telling us. The electrons will be found in certain locations. So it defines the probability of finding an electron. In an orbit, the Bohr model, that was a fixed path. But with the quantum mechanical model, we get orbitals, which are probable regions of where we think we'll find the electron based on the math of Schrodinger. Okay? Now, let's look here. We're looking at a graph of an electron probability versus the distance. So here we are at the nucleus, and it says basically there's no chance the electron is going to be at the nucleus. It will tend to be a small distance away. So for this atom, you know, the highest probability is about 50 picometers away. It could be closer. It could be real, right in here. It could be farther away. It could be really far away. But, it, you know, at some point, it's not attached to the atom anymore, right? So based on this little diagram, an orbital, or what we might refer to as an electron cloud, is the space where the electron is going to be found in 90% of the time. So if I draw this little circle around this atom, let's call that an S orbital for right now. Notice all the little dots represent where the electron could be found. Most of the time, they're within that region. But every once in a while, you see it gets out of that little circle. And that's what we're talking about when we use the term orbital. Now, the quantum numbers, there are actually four quantum numbers that will describe uh, each atom and, and makes them unique. Kind of like you have a unique fingerprint or we all have a unique social security number. Now, AP Chemistry no longer requires students to know quantum numbers. So I'm going to go through this, but it will not be something that I will ask you. So if you feel that you need to fast forward through this part on quantum numbers, that's fine. I'm not going to ask you a lot of questions about it. All right. Now, maybe you've gone to a concert before, and when you buy a ticket, it has certain information on it, right? It has on there the date of the concert. It has on there probably the price you paid for the ticket. It has on there the section that you're going to sit in. You're either in the upper bowl, the lower bowl, right, uh, the club level, wherever. Then once you're in the upper level, it might have a section. You're in section 344. And then within section 344, it'll say row 6, seat 2, right? So it becomes very, very specific. If you want to think about, like, addressing an envelope, right, you have to put a name, an address, a city, and a zip code. And if you do that correctly and you put the stamp on there, it will be delivered to that address. So in chemistry, every atom has what are called four unique quantum numbers that give the address of where the electron will be. Now, they have letters. The principal quantum number is N, the angular momentum. Quantum number is L, magnetic M sub L, and spin M sub S. 
Now, I'll go into that a little bit more later. Let's go on and talk about some of those orbitals. Some of the orbitals have different shapes. There are S orbitals, and if you want to think of S as spherically shaped, that's great. So in the first row of the periodic table, you'll find the element hydrogen and helium. And it turns out those are both going to be S orbitals, and they'll fit in the 1S orbital. And I know that because when I look at the periodic table, they're in the first energy level. The number 1 here is referring to this 1 right here. Now, if I generically make my periodic table, I don't know if you can see that in the camera. I'm going to try to make that a little bit bigger for you. Let's go here. All right. So when I hold this up, we have an S, we have a P, we have a D, and we have an F orbital. And those correspond to, on the periodic table, the different regions on here. We got the S region over here, we got the P over here, the D in the middle, and the F down here. Okay, so S region, P region, D region in the middle, and F down here. Now, a 2S orbital refers to an S orbital that's in the second energy level. Now, there's also a 3S, there's one from each level. So the principal quantum number, N, is referring to the number in front, the 1, the 2, or the 3. That's the principal quantum number. And on a periodic table, we'll, we'll learn there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 periods. So there's the principal quantum numbers go 1 through 7. They refer to the energy level or the row in the periodic table. And they do have different sizes. They get bigger as you go up in number. If we're trying to find out the number of orbitals that are available, that will be n squared. More on that a little bit later. right? I mean, if I say if you're in the first energy level, 1 squared is 1. So there's only one s orbital. When we do in the second energy level, 2 squared is 4 it turns out there's going to be one s orbital and what are called 3p orbitals. And again, I understand this stuff gets very complicated very quickly. Let's, let's, let's try to visualize this a little bit. right? Maybe you've cut an onion before and it looks like there's little growth rings or like on a tree, you can see the growth rings. right? And those might represent the orbitals going out, the 1s orbital, the 2s orbital, the 3s orbital, and so on. Okay. Now, when Schrodinger does the math, you get different shapes that come out of it, solutions. One of them is an S orbital. We refer to that as spherical, okay, round. Then there are three different P orbitals. Now, what they might look the same, but they're actually different. This one is P sub X. It's on the X plane. This one is P sub Y, it's on the Y plane, and this one's on the Z plane, three-dimensionally. When we get to the D orbitals, there's one, two, three, four, five of those, and when we look at the F orbitals, there's going to be seven of those. Okay. Now, if you were to take a single S and three P orbitals and put them all together, can you see here's the one S, and then here, and then we have we have the P sub X, P sub Y, and P sub Z, and they all start to overlap, right? So this diagram, here's an S, here's three different P's, and here's five different D's. That is a huge mess, isn't it? If you have to try to draw that out and take notes on that, you can't do it. It's just going to be a giant mess. Here's a nice computer simulation. I've got a 1S orbital kind of in the center, this circular one. Then I've got the, the three P's, the piece of X, piece of Y, piece of Z, and then I have a 2S, right? And that's why in chemistry class, the Bohr model with the rings around it, with electrons in fixed orbit, is what's taught, right? Now, we don't need to necessarily fully understand these orbitals as long as we can write out their electronic configurations. This graph is supposed to show us what it looks like. If you have a 1s, right, the electron can be, it's basically in this region close to the nucleus, but it can be farther away to this side, farther away to the right, 
and it's spread out. That's a 1s. If you were to look at the Schrodinger equations math answer for a 2s orbital, it ends up looking like this, where you get a region it can be, a high probability, a low probability, a little higher. So most of the electrons are here. Then there's kind of like an empty space, a void, and then there's another ring out here. And here's a 3s. Here they are in the 1s, the 2s, and the 3s region. So these are the mathematical solutions that you get. And so for students looking at that, they're saying, oh, so this is like the Bohr model, and these are the fixed paths or the rings. Okay, if that's how you see it, then that's what we'll go with. Okay, but it's really referring to a probability of where you can find the electron. That's what an orbital is, not a fixed path. A fixed path is an orbit. Again, those p orbitals can go on the x plane, they can go on the y plane, or they go on the z plane. All of those are different paths. Sort of like if you have a GPS and you try to go to a new location, it might give you the fastest path, the shortest driving, the shortest uh, uh, amount of miles, or the one with uh, no tolls. Right? Multiple ways we can do that. So within the atom, there are these different roads, these different orbitals the electrons reside in. All right, And so they're not really solid. They're more like what I'm showing here, where there's a higher region, lower region, and then no, no, no time it'll be in the middle. So there's our S, our P orbitals. You can draw them out with computers if you want. Again, I'm going to try to speed this up a little bit for you. I'm skipping this guy. This is simply showing us those orbitals in different orientations, right? The X plane, the Y plane, and the Z plane. And we can see them orienting around there. And then we can put them all together if we want. All right, more on quantum numbers. So that first quantum number, the principal quantum number, refers to the row on the periodic table. And that's N. Then you have the angular momentum one, L. And this has to do with the type sublevel. Is it an S, a P, a D, or an F? Now, it turns out, when we're looking at this, that if you do N minus 1, you get the angular momentum. So if, if you have N equals 1, then, well, if you do the math, 1 minus 1 is 0. 0 is an S orbital. And we'll practice all of this stuff. All right. Um, Again, a lot of this stuff is interesting, and it's, you, you go through it in college, but I think it's maybe beyond the scope of what I want to do for this year with remote learning. If you're in class, I could, I could read your face a little better. So I'm going to skip through a lot of this stuff right now. Okay. Sometimes we might think of an atom sort of like uh, kind of the rings of Saturn, where here's the 1s orbital where the electron can be, and here's the nucleus with its neutrons and protons. And then you can have other regions. You can have the 2s region out here. This ring, you can imagine, should really go all the way around it. And then the 2ps are a little farther away, higher energy going out. So the second energy level has the, the s and the p. The third energy level has s and p and d. And notice the d energy is higher level, farther away from the nucleus than a p, and so on. Okay. All right, and again, this is really a very simplistic model trying to get what you understand, the Bohr model, and making it a little bit, a little bit more like the quantum mechanical model. So even from a distance, this might look like a single ring, but when you get closer up, you'll see there's actually two different paths the electrons can go on. All right. So the principal level is n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7. Then when you do n minus 1, well, when you do n minus 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. That refers to an s. On this one, when you do n minus 1, 2 minus 1, you end up with an s and a p. Over here, you get an s, a p, and a d. And then when you split these up, the orbitals, remember there's three different p's, an x, y, z. So here there's an x, y, z. And the D's, there's five of, okay? So N is the number of sublevels. N squared is the number of orbitals. See, if you do two squared, you get four, don't you? So you would get an S orbital, 
and three p orbitals, so that would be four orbitals. When you do three squared, well, three squared is nine. You get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then the s orbital is the ninth one. All right, so let's keep looking. So every time we have an s, you get one of those orbitals. Every time you have a p, there's three available. D's, there are five, and F's, there are seven. Now it turns out that we're going to be able to put two electrons in each orbital, and that's going to correspond to, on the periodic table, how many squares going across, because these first two regions, this one over here, is the S region. It's two elements wide. That's not coincidental. All right. So again, let me hold this up for you. So this is the S region. It's too wide because S, you can have two electrons in that orbital. I said this region over here was the P region. There's three P orbitals, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six regions here because three orbitals, each can hold two electrons, gives us six regions. Now, in the central region, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 regions, so there must be five d orbitals. And on the bottom, if you take the time to count it, there's 14 squares going across. That's the F region, so there are seven orbitals in there. And again, I understand that this is not making a whole heck of a lot of sense to you at this moment, okay? It will, it will, okay? This is a two-day lesson. Day one is just background information. So if you have the n of 1, 2, 3, 4, then L, remember, is n minus 1. So this would be a 0. This would be a 0 and a 1. 0, 1, 2. 0, 1, 2, 3 is the L. What those correspond to, every time you have a 0, it's an S. See, every time there's a 0, it's an S. When you have a L of 1, that's a p orbital. L of 1 is a p orbital. L of 1 is a p. When you have a d orbital, L is 2. When you have an f orbital, L is 3. And then, of course, there are only, is only one s orbital in each level. So in the first level, there's one s orbital. In the second energy level, there's one s orbital. We would call it the 2s orbital, but there's only one of them. In the third energy level, there's only one s orbital. It would be the 3s orbital. If you go back and think about those circles, there was a 1s, a 2s, and a 3s, and those were the s orbitals. Each time you have a p orbital, you get three of those. p orbitals, there's three. d's, there are five, and f's, there are seven. Each orbital, each singular orbital, can hold two electrons. So all I've done here is if there's one orbital, it can hold two electrons. Three orbitals can hold six. 5 can hold 10, 7 can hold 14. Now, what I started to say at the beginning was 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Those were the filling order that I was reading. Now, once you understand how to read it from the periodic table, it's really quite simple. So in the first period, the first row, you can hold two electrons. In the second energy level, you can hold a maximum of eight, and then 18. And maybe you had to do that uh, filling order with the Bohr model. Maybe you kind of remember doing that, that two electrons went in the first energy level, and it was sort of like maybe the teacher used an analogy of a parking deck. When the parking deck is full, there's no parking spots available on the first deck, then you go to the second level and you fill that up, and then when that's full, you go to the third, and so on. So the capacity is 2n squared. Now we get to the magnetic quantum number. Remember I told you, with four quantum numbers, we can know specifically which element we're talking about. Now, magnetic quantum number has to do with the orientation. Okay, So is it a piece of x, a piece of y, or a piece of z? Right? Those would be the three uh, magnetic quantum numbers uh, for a p orbital. And they would go negative 1, 0, and positive 1 when we would do that. Okay? 
The D orbitals, we get five of those, and the orientations are shown on the bottom. And if we think about it, the L was two. So the magnetic quantum number, M sub L, is going to be negative two to positive two. So negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, positive two. And that gives me the five magnetic quantum numbers. So magnetic quantum numbers are, again, they go from negative L to L, and they include the number zero in between. So for an S, there's only one. For a P, there will be three. For a D, five. And an F, seven. All right, I'm going to skip all that stuff. Let's see if this stuff starts to make sense. So in the first energy level, the electrons are going to go in down here, those first two electrons, and, and they'll fit in here. When that's full, they go to the next available. Think about water filling a bucket. It's going to fill from the bottom, and it's going to work its way up. So this is the lowest level. That's where the first two electrons go. Notice that this principal level 2 on the S is slightly lower than the P's. So the next two electrons go here. So 1s2, 2s2. And then they start to fill up in the two P's. And we can hold six electrons total there, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. But it turns out when they fill up, there's a rule. And this one we call Hund's rule. It's named after a person named Hund. And sometimes I refer to this as the urinal rule or the creepy guy in a bus rule. Now, on the urinal rule, if there are three urinals and somebody is standing on the far right, the next guy stands on the far left, right? That's the rule. Guys understand this. For girls, let me explain it this way. If you're the only person riding on a bus and an older creepy man gets in the bus and decides to sit in your chair with you, unacceptable. There's 30 other places this guy can sit. He does not sit with you. And what that means here for us is the first electron for the p orbital goes here. The second one goes here. The third one goes here. Everybody gets one before you double up. You don't put two, two, none. Okay. If you have five electrons to fill in, you'd put one here, two here, three here, four here, five. So it would go two, two, one. More on that later. The spin quantum number refers to how the electrons can fit in an orbital. Remember, in a single orbital, you may put two electrons, but those electrons have a spin. When an electron moves, it creates a magnetic field. Think about two bar magnets. If you put two bar magnets next to each other, they will repel each other. The only way you can get them to go near each other is if you have one with the north pole up and the other one with the north pole down. And we call this the spin quantum number. We'll say spin up and spin down, plus one half, minus one half. So the electrons have to be spinning in opposite directions in order to go into an orbital. And again, we will take uh, a half a day to talk about filling orbitals. And this stuff's going to make a lot more sense after tomorrow. Okay? All right. Again, I'm not going to read all that. I'm going to keep moving to get us through the functional part, what you're going to have to be able to do. This is simply suggesting that two magnets, when they move, create force fields that, uh, if they're spinning in opposite directions, will attract. If they're spinning in the same direction, they will repel. Opposites attract. All right, so let's deal with some other terms, some contributions. Wolfgang Pauli came up with this thing called the Pauli Exclusion Principle. Right? And he said, basically, no two electrons in an atom can have the same four quantum numbers. Right? Just like no two people can be exactly alike. Even if you're an identical twin, there are differences between identical twins. Each electron has a unique address described by those four quantum numbers. The principal quantum number referred to the energy level or the row on the periodic table. So principal level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Okay. So if I say 2s2, the, the first two is the energy level. Angular momentum is the sublevel, an s, a p, a d, or an f. 
in S orbital is going to be a 0, a P a 1, a D a 2, an F a 3. The magnetic one is the specific orbital that you're dealing with, P sub X, P sub Y, or P sub Z. Okay? Remember, if this was, if, if S here referred to a 0 and uh, P is a 1, then you get negative 1, 0, and positive 1 for P sub X, P sub Y, P sub Z. And then the spin was plus 1 half, minus 1 half. All right. Again, allowed sets. Let's see if this makes any sense to you. Okay. If we have N equals 1, so we're talking an S orbital. It's a sublevel 0. That makes it an S. And there's only one way you can have an S orbital. It's always the same. So one of the electrons, this one right here, I'm going to say is spin up. I'm going to call that plus 1 half. And the other one going down here is minus 1 half. That's spin down. So when I say 1S2, I'm referring to those two electrons. Then I say 2S2. Well. The second energy level is the big 2. Then I say S level, that's a 0 or an S, and then go spin up, spin down. So 1S2, 2S2. Then I would say 2P6. It's still in the second energy level. It's a P orbital. L is 1, and they go from 1, 0 to negative 1. I put in my electrons. Spin up 1, spin up 2, spin up 3, down 4, 5, 6. So if I count all these, I'd say 2p6. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, followed by 3s2, 3p6, and, and, and 3d10, and so on. All right? Now, this is normally what I, if I could see your face right now, this is what you'd say. Teacher, may, may I be excused? My brain is full. Right? I'd say, well, I'll go ahead and read the section of the book. That probably doesn't even correspond to your textbook. But, um, hey, it's understandable that this stuff doesn't make a huge amount of sense yet. I'm going to stop this video, and then I'm going to record another one where I go through maybe less detail on the, the, the big terms and talk about what you actually have to do. All right? Thanks for staying with me, and stick with this, and you'll get it figured out. Bye-bye.